Today's project is, surprise, surprise, a little audio project, and it's a small amplifier, and it's a kit of parts, and those are the parts as supplied with the kit. It's very cheap, seven or so dollars, New Zealand dollars, and it's a stereo amplifier based on the TDA 2030A, which is a very quite old ship and one that's been around for a long time and is still in current use today. This is the main PCB. Not really much to say about it. All the components are labelled. It's a nice fibreglass board and if we flip it over, again very nicely made. I don't propose to assemble it live on camera because quite honestly I don't really see any point in me showing you me stuffing components into holes and soldering them. It's a way to make a two hour video but I'm hoping this isn't going to last quite as long as two hours. And one thing I have noticed uh, there is no mica washer supplied but it doesn't matter because the heat sink goes into um, holes on the PCB as you can see here the mounting holes are not electrically connected to anything so it doesn't need a mica washer but I will put some silicon grease on there because it's going to need all the help it can get in transferring the heat. Now unusual for Chinese modules this one actually includes a circuit diagram all this needs to connect up is an input source, obviously, and a mains transformer, which requires, or that the requirement is 12 volts AC center tap, so 12 naught 12. And as you can see here by the input, the switch is supplied, and there's a standard power supply here to give plus or minus 17 volts and is smoothed by these reasonably generous capacitors and the obligatory LED to show that it hasn't blown up yet. Now somewhat unusual this actually has base and treble controls built in and if you look from here here is the input. Now for some, some strange reason there's a 1k ohm in series with each input. Not totally sure why that is but it's a sufficiently low value that it's not going to make any difference. Comes here to the volume control and then it goes through this series of filters. This one, including that capacitor and that capacitor, is the treble control and this potentiometer configured that way, which is a bog standard tone control, is the base control to the op amp via that 10 microfarad capacitor. This is the main op amp, the TDA 2030A. There's, this is just one channel, the other channel's down there, but it's exactly the same. It runs on plus or minus, plus and minus, I should say, 17 volts, which is a reasonably good figure for the expected output. Now it's claimed that this is 15 watts into four or eight ohms. Um, I don't quite see how it will be the same because theoretically if the voltage remains the same the power would increase. My first impression is I wouldn't recommend using 4 ohms with this anyway because these little heat sinks there's no way that's going to be suitable for 15 watts into 4 ohms. It's just no way and you could fry eggs on that. Anyway we, we won't get or um, technical at this stage because I realize this is not a hi-fi project and I don't want to put hi-fi values on it but to me if an amplifier is rated at 15 watts into a specific impedance it should be able to deliver pre-clipped power into that load there's no good saying this will give 25 watts if it, that's at 10% distortion because that is completely clipped and unable to listen to it. So to me, a 10 watt amplifier pre-clipping 
is how you should rate it. But we will see. Right, well, we've, we're getting on towards the end of this, but I'd show you how I found the easiest way to mount the output chips. Now, initially you need to make sure all the pins line up because they inherently don't. So push it through the board until you can see the pins coming through, but don't solder at this stage. The next thing you want to do is to get the heat sink, make sure it's clean and pop, pop this on. I'm going to try to do this around the camera, it's not easy. Pop those through the holes. Right, that's through. And now we need to solder the heat sinks on. Holding it down flush because we don't want the heat sink to be at an angle. And same with the pins the other side. This takes quite a bit of heat because obviously it's a heat sink. That first one's good, but the second one is less than good. So I'll do that again. It sucks all the heat away from the iron. That's the problem. That's better. Yep, that looks good. Now is the time to put the heat sink compound on. Now the first one I did, I put the heat sink compound on first. Now that's an error because I got covered in it. So I'm going to use a little cotton bud this time and just bend that down slightly. That's fine, I'm still fairly covered in it but never mind. Now we can offer that up to the heat sink and hopefully the hole will line up ready for the screw. So let's see if it will. It's a lot easier when you haven't got a mica washer to deal with. Now at the moment it's still not soldered because you, want this, you don't want any stress to be on the pins when you to tighten this up. So we can tighten that up, flip it over, and there we go. Let's zoom in a bit so you can see what we're doing. Hopefully it won't go out of focus. And we get a nice leaded solder. By doing it this way, of course, there's no stress on the chip itself when you bend, end up bending the pins. And that's what it looks like from the top. All I've got to do now is just wipe around the edges of those chips so it looks nice and I don't get covered in silicon grease yet again. Well, we have the amplifier on the bench and I've connected it to a 12 naught 12 transformer and we should have 17 naught 17 on the DC side we've actually got 18.4 so we're giving it a little bit more than specified so let's see what power we can get I have my load box connected up and it will see 8 ohms on each channel there's the amplifier the LED is a light. We're going to feed it with one kilohertz and the tone controls will be flat. Not that it makes any significant difference at one kilohertz. And I'm just going to adjust the level here and we'll look at the scope and see when it clips. Now we're actually getting, I don't want to leave it on too long because the heat sinks get really hot. At that point there, we are getting 8.82 .8 watts, one channel driven. Now if we drive both channels, you can see it's clipping now because the power supply is sagging. So if we take it down a fraction and look at that, 
we have seven. So we'll just do the mathematics. Oh, we now have a miserable 6.12 watts. Right, we'll do the same test now. Now I can only do this with one channel operating, it, and that is we're connecting one channel to four ohms because I need to put both my load resistors in parallel. I'm going to take this very quickly because the heat sinks we're going to, are going to get so hot. So there's clipping just under, and we've got 6.4. 6.4 times 6.4 equals divided by 4. Ah, we've just made 10.24 watts into 4 ohms, 1 channel driven. Right, some conclusions. Well, first of all, whatever you do, you don't want to drive this into sine wave into 4 ohms uh, with 1 channel driven, let alone 2, because the heat sinks get really really hot too hot to touch shall we say and that's after about 15 20 seconds but saying that these little heat sinks will be fine if you're just playing music and in music you can get um, peaks of 10 to 12 watts into 8 ohms because it's the power supply they've only got two capacitors uh, one on each rail which you could argue is not really enough um, but saying that it is what it is it's a little amplify and for playing into little monitor speakers or um, I use it for the monitoring the um, computer and it does get surprisingly loud and it doesn't sound bad at all but what I would say is there is a noticeable buzz on it now it's not input type buzz because um, it's 100 cycle, or 100 hertz, I should say, showing my age there. Um, there is a noticeable hum on the sound. Uh, not noticeable more than about a foot from the speaker, but it's well below the noise floor, or well above the noise floor, I should say. Um, and I don't know what causes it, because I've actually change the smoothing capacitors with a higher value one to try it and it didn't make any difference so I can only really put it down to the fact that um, there may be the earthing isn't correct internally on the on the PCB but it's not enough harm to um, to put you off it but um, so that, that's really my only reservations the sound quality is reasonably good it's a little fatiguing long term, but that's listening to it on the main speakers in the living room. And that's something you wouldn't generally do, not with a $7 amplifier. I keep saying $7, but it's not really $7 because you have to put a mains transformer on it. The, and that's going to cost you probably about $20 New Zealand. So it's really a $27 amplifier. Um, people always forget that the bit that costs the money isn't the PCB and the components on it, it's the mains transformer. Whether you use, I've tried it on a switch mode power supply and uh, it works fine on there. There's no noticeable squeaks and whistles coming through. But 12 volt transformers like this are relatively low cost. But don't forget, you do need, well, it's, it's really a 12 naught 12 or, or IE, a 24 volt center tap transformer rated at about 25, 30 watts. So that will let it run cool and um, everything should be fine. So would I recommend it? Um, yes, I think I would. It, it all went together well and it sounds certainly as good as you'd expect it to sound and it, it has a, a pleasant sound shall we say uh, rather than an accurate sound the tone controls when they're set to 12 o'clock are not flat um, you need them the bass control you need to set at about 11 o'clock and the treble control at about two o'clock um, it could well be that they've supplied 
logarithmic pots instead of linear pots but now I've got it assembled it's quite hard to measure them to see plus they are what they are um, you just adjust the tone controls so it sounds pleasant to your ear <laughs>